If you have been following this series of videos based on my new book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, then I'm excited to tell you the time has finally come to factor in other areas of Bible prophecy. How might the rapture fit into all of this? Just to be upfront, I am a pre-tribulation rapture believer, but I do believe that if you are not, the information in this video can still be of great use to you. With the proper understanding of the mechanics of the rapture, we can more easily find the best location to place it on the prophetic timeline. We can then compare it with the rest of the pieces we've already laid out and see how everything might fit together. If what the Dead Sea Scrolls says is true about angels performing temple duties in heaven at the same time they are performed on earth, at least during the age of Torah, then this brings up an interesting line of thought. Time itself, either to a certain degree or completely, operates in heaven the same way as it does on earth. There are those today who say time in heaven is different than time on earth citing verses in Psalm 90 and 2 Peter 3 as evidence. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Psalm 94, KJV. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. 2 Peter 3, 8, KJV. There are also those who maintain that time operates the same as what we experience on earth, citing verses from Revelation chapters 8 and 22. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Revelation 8, 1 KJV. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22 verse 8 KJV. In this part of the video, I want to explore both possibilities and try to answer whether there is a way to harmonize these two views. Does time operate differently or the same in heaven as it does on earth? Now, before we delve into this topic, we must remember, it is not the rapture that begins the 70th week of Daniel or the seven year tribulation as it's commonly referred to. The confirmation of the covenant with many starts the seven year countdown until the return of Jesus. If you are a pre-tribulation rapture believer as I am, then you would argue that the rapture begins sometime prior to the tribulation. If you're a mid-tribulation or pre-wrath rapture believer, then you believe the rapture happens sometime around or just after the middle of the tribulation. And lastly, if you hold the post-tribulation view, then you maintain that the rapture occurs at Jesus' return around the very end of the tribulation. Now, this video is not intended to present an argument for one view over the other, although since I am a pre-tribulation rapture believer myself, and uh, that is the view I'm most familiar with, I will be explaining my position from that perspective. But rather, my hope is that Christians of all rapture beliefs will be able to find this video helpful. There are two major views that I want to explore. Now, what I'm about to get into with the first view will sound a bit complicated, but don't worry and please stick with me even if you're confused because afterward, I'm going to explain the second view, which will majorly simplify all of this into something anyone can understand. You will also see a great example of how sometimes we tend to overcomplicate things. Most times there's a simple solution. So with that, let's talk about the first view, which says that there exists multiple dimensions of time. This is the time works differently in heaven view. First, let's consider the possibility that time does run in heaven, at least in part differently than it does on earth. Now, I don't believe that time could possibly run totally differently in heaven because that would render Revelation 8.1 and 22.8 nonsensical. But I suppose an argument of allegory could be made Though I'm not an allegorist in my eschatology, so I would not be one to support such thinking. One might wonder if I'm compromising too much by choosing the partly view, rather than just saying all or none. I mean, after all, isn't it inconsistent to say that time can run partly one way and partly another in the same place? Well, the good news for this position is that time runs partly in all sorts of ways in our own three-dimensional universe. In fact, we even see slight variations on our own planet. The single dimension of time that we know of is not solid and uniform as we tend to think. Time, much like space, can be bent and warped to the point of making it relative. 
So for example, time near a black hole is warped to the point that one year of Earth time can pass by in a single second. The closer you are to the black hole, the faster time around you moves. However, to you, time would feel the same, which is why we say time is relative. To you, if you were looking at the universe from a vantage point near a black hole, it would look like somebody pushed the fast forward button on everything and everything would speed up. That's because time is moving differently relative to you. Experiments have even been conducted on Earth showing a clock on a fast-moving jet and a stationary clock on the ground actually record time differently. The clocks are both recording time correctly, though time itself is moving slightly differently on the jet than time on the ground. Things like gravity and momentum can affect time in the same way folding a piece of paper can affect its length. As of now, human beings are only aware of one dimension of time, so this means time is like a line made of multiple points. The past is behind us, the future is in front of us, and the present is constantly progressing from one point to the next, away from the past towards the future. Albert Einstein, with his theory of special relativity, was able to show that time and space are linked in similar and predictable ways. We can measure time in seconds and minutes, just like we can measure space in inches and feet. With space, however, we are blessed to be able to perceive more than one dimension. We can experience and measure three dimensions of space. So what if there are extra dimensions of time that we cannot physically perceive, but that exist nonetheless? Since time and space are linked so closely together, so much so that a new word space-time was developed in the early 1900s to describe it, we can use known measurements of space to try to understand how something like a second dimension of time might work. Imagine a large rectangular room that we've been commissioned to install tiles in. We know that our tiles are squares that are one foot long and wide. So how many tiles do we need for this floor? To find out, we would need to measure the area, the two-dimensional surface of the floor of the room. We do this by measuring two perpendicular walls to find the length and width of the room, then multiply those two numbers together to find out how many square feet. And for our international friends, a square foot is a single unit of a square that is one foot long and one foot wide. Now, for example, if one of the longer walls is 20 feet and one of the other shorter walls is 15 feet, then we multiply those to find out that the room is 300 square feet. 15 times 20 equals 300. In other words, we would need 300 of our tiles to cover this floor. We can measure a hypothetical second dimension of time in the same way. Now, because we are human beings and can only really imagine one dimension of time, we have to rely on math to figure this out. But in doing so, we'll have to just accept the fact that we cannot envision this in our own minds. Now, while I can easily imagine a square foot tile, I cannot precisely imagine a square minute or a square hour. But simply not being able to imagine it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just like space, for time to be bent, it stands to reason there must be a second dimension of time for it to bend into. It's the same way that we can have a straight one-dimensional line, but cannot bend that line unless we have access to a second dimension to bend it into. Time absolutely can be bent, and this happens pretty frequently throughout the universe, so there very well could exist multiple dimensions of time. Now, for our purposes here, let's take 2 Peter 3, 8 incredibly literally. I don't necessarily believe it's meant to be understood this way, but we can use this to help explain how time can be both the same and different in heaven and on earth. That verse says that a thousand years for us is like a day for God, but it also seems to say the opposite, that a day for us is like a thousand years for God, depending how you read the verse. For God to literally experience a thousand years within a single day, there would have to be multiple dimensions of time. We can do some simple math to figure this out. Let's assume the day here is the one dimension of time we can perceive. For God to experience a thousand years within the span of that day, we need to find out what the width measurement of time would be. In this example, the thousand years would be our total area. It would be like saying there are 20 feet in this one foot length. Well, for that to work, the width itself would have to be 20 feet since one times 20 is 20. 
So you have one foot length, 20 foot width. This is how 20 feet can fit inside one foot. The width and the square area would be the same, making it very easy to figure out. So if we know there are 1,000 years in a single day, according to this verse from God's perspective, then the length is one day, the area is 365,000 days or 1,000 years. So we just divide those and find the width of time to come out to the same number, 365,000 days or 1,000 years. Therefore, if there are only two dimensions of time, the width of time that God experiences would be 1,000 years, which is exactly what 2 Peter 3, 8 is telling us. Now, if there were three dimensions of time, we would have to know the volume, the, the three-dimensional occupied area, the length and the width to find the height measurement in days. Hypothetically, if our length is one day and our total volume is 365,000 days or 1,000 years, we don't have enough information to find the exact height and width. Those could vary. If we assume the height is one year or 365 days, then the width would have to be 1,000 days, roughly 2.74 years, because we would multiply length by width by height to find the volume. So one day times 365 days times 1,000 days equals 365,000 days or 1,000 years. Now, technically these would be cubed units of time, meaning each unit of time would be one day long, one day wide, one day high. Now, I know that is probably confusing and that is okay. It is supposed to be. Again, we cannot really get our heads around extra dimensions of time because we have no way of envisioning them. But this does show us that extra time can fit into smaller units of recognizable time if there are multiple dimensions of time. So in short, the events of 1,000 years in heaven could occur in only one day of our earth time. There is more time to fit in everything in heaven without violating the fact that time still operates the way it does on earth. We can say a day has passed on earth and a thousand years have passed in heaven without contradiction, just like we can say a room is both 20 feet and 15 feet. We're just describing the length and the width. This is important because if there is a seven year tribulation and if the rapture occurs just prior to the beginning of the tribulation, and if we as Christians receive our rewards during our roughly seven years in heaven, then we want to understand how seven years is enough time to give rewards to every Christian from the past 2000 years or so. We know from 1 Corinthians 3 that every believer will stand before Jesus while he determines what rewards have been earned. Each builder's work will be plainly seen for the day will make it clear because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what kind of work each has done. If what someone has built survives, he will receive a reward. If someone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as through fire. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 14, NET. From Revelation 19, we learn that the church has already been rewarded at the return of Jesus. Then I heard what sounded like the voice of a vast throng, like the roar of many waters and like loud crashes of thunder. They were shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the all-powerful reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, because the wedding celebration of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. She was permitted to be dressed in bright, clean, fine linen, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write the following, Blessed are those who are invited to the banquet at the wedding celebration of the Lamb. He also said to me, These are the true words of God. Revelation 19, 6-9 NET. Therefore, most assume that this must have occurred within that roughly seven-year time frame between the rapture and the return of Jesus. However, is seven years enough time to make sure everyone has time with Jesus individually? To figure this out, we would have to make some assumptions. For example, we must assume that Revelation 19 is describing the same thing as 1 Corinthians 3, because there are other ways to understand these passages. We also must accept that the rapture happens near the confirmation of the covenant, meaning we have roughly seven years to work with. Lastly, we have to assume that giving rewards is done individually and not corporately all at the same time. It is possible that we all stand before Christ and receive rewards at the same time, but when we read through the text, it sounds as if it will be more of an individual one after the other kind of event. We can do some simple math to see how this may all play out. Even in these numbers, however, we must make assumptions. How many true Christians have existed for the past 2,000 years? There's really no way to know. 
Statistics today say there are roughly 2.3 billion Christians on the planet. However, we know the true number is likely impossible to calculate. How many people call themselves Christian but do not have a real relationship with Jesus? How many cults are there who describe themselves as Christian but are not trusting Christ the way the Bible describes? How many individuals are cultural Christians, meaning they take on the label only because that's what their friends and families call themselves? It's impossible to know exactly how many true Christians exist today in the world. We can only guess. So let's err on the side of a conservative estimate and say that roughly 10% of people who call themselves Christian are true believers in Jesus. So 10% of 2.3 billion is 230 million, but that only tells us how many there are today. What about throughout the past 2000 years? Well, this becomes extra impossible to calculate accurately, so we have to make some guesses. We know the world's population is constantly growing, and because of this, we also know that the number of Christians has been rising. Despite this, it seems like there would have been a higher percentage of true Christians a hundred years ago than there would be today, but we can't really know that for sure. Again, to be conservative and just for the sheer sake of needing a number, Let's assume that the number of Christians today is equal to the number of Christians throughout the past 2,000 years due to the lower population. Let's assume there have been roughly 500 million Christians from the time of Christ on into today. How long does a reward determination take? Let's say there are no extra dimensions of time and it takes a full hour for Jesus to go through an individual's life. If we multiply seven years by 365 days by 24 hours, we discover there are 61,320 hours within a seven year period. Now, certainly there must be more than 61,320 true Christians throughout the past 2000 years. Now, if there are multiple dimensions of time, that would be no problem. If there are two dimensions of time, we would multiply 61,320 by itself to find the square number, and this would accommodate roughly 3.7 billion Christians within a seven year period. And that is only with one extra dimension of time. If there were three dimensions of time, there would be time for about 230.5 trillion Christians to have an hour with the Lord. But if there are no extra dimensions of time, and if we only have seven years to work with, we need a shorter interval for the giving of rewards to accommodate more Christians. So let's say each Christian gets 10 minutes before the Lord. Well, there are six 10 minute segments within an hour. So all we have to do is multiply 61,320 by six. That would accommodate 367,920 Christians. That still seems kind of low. What if everyone were to only receive one minute with the Lord? Well then, 3,679,200 Christians, or almost 3.7 million, uh, could be accommodated. That still seems like a low number of Christians for all 2,000 years, but at least that's a little more plausible. Having only one minute with the Lord, though, seems incredibly fast. Is one minute enough time to go through the actions of a single Christian's life? Perhaps, perhaps not. We don't know enough about how the reward system works to determine for sure. We don't know what the process is like. Even more, this is all assuming a pre-tribulation rapture. If we consider a mid-tribulation or pre-wrath, we would have even less time to work with. You would have to cut the time in half. Post-tribulation rapture believers would have the most difficulty in making these numbers work. However, as promised, there is another option that allows us to discard the complexity of multiple dimensions of time and not have to worry about the incredibly low number of Christians or short amount of time with the Lord. This option accommodates all passages quite well concerning rewards, length of time from God's perspective, a pre-tribulation rapture, and a seven-year tribulation. Perhaps it is just as simple as there being a greater length of time between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation period than we typically think. With this one simple idea, every complicated calculation we just went over melts away. The verse about a day being as a thousand years, 2 Peter 3, 8, could refer to the concept of ages of human history being modeled around the calendar week. And we certainly see that in the writings of the ancient church fathers. They describe 7,000 years of human history modeled after our seven day week. The half hour and months mentioned in the book of Revelation can mean exactly as they say. 
We can take the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Bible at their word that time operates the same in heaven as it does on Earth, but we don't have to discount the possibility of extra dimensions of time. We're just not required to consider them. After all, the measurements of time we are given in the Bible are set by human standards. Measurements of space are like that too. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to human measurement, which is also the angels. Revelation 21, 17, NET. If human measurements of length are given, even with the mention of it being the same as what an angel uses, then it stands to reason that time would be measured in the same way. This again doesn't discount the fact that there might be extra dimensions of time, just like there very well could be extra dimensions of space comprising the heavenly Jerusalem. All it means is from a human perspective, these are the discernible measurements. If there are extra spatial dimensions, it does us no good to consider them because we don't have an extra dimensional ruler or measuring tape with which to measure them. Now, by way of comparison, our room from earlier is only 20 feet long to a one dimensional being. That doesn't mean that the 15 foot width doesn't exist. The width simply is not considered because it doesn't apply to a one dimensional being. From the perspective of the one dimensional being, there is no width. It doesn't need to be considered. Yet the 20 foot measurement is still true. Clarence Larkin, one of the most influential dispensationalist writers of the 20th century, noted that it is possible that decades could pass between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. Quote, so if we could fix the exact date when the century will close and count back seven years, the rapture might occur five, 10, or even 25 years before that. So as to give time for the rebuilding of Babylon and other events that are to occur before the tribulation period can begin. Otherwise, the rapture would not be a surprise. When we seriously consider this possibility, we find it answers other questions as well. For example, how would the disappearance of possibly millions of people not immediately clue in the rest of those left behind to the fact that this was the rapture and that God is real? As we find throughout Revelation, however, the human beings alive on earth are horrendously unrepentant for the most part, and only a few true believers remain. This is admittedly more of an impression from the text because exact numbers are not given. However, a major assumption today especially among unbelievers, is that the rapture begins the seven-year tribulation. If millions of people disappear, then a full seven-year period comes and goes without major incident, it would be reasonable to assume that most of the world would breathe a sigh of relief and conclude that this wasn't the biblical rapture, but some other phenomenon. Now, imagine that 30 or 40 years pass. At this time, adults who were not alive when the great disappearance occurred would be running the world. They would have no real frame of reference for it. They would have inherited a world built after the disappearance, and they couldn't be expected to have the same level of respect for it as those alive during that time would. For example, think of the recent rise of the popularity and acceptance of socialism in our younger generations. They don't fully appreciate the horrors of socialism because they weren't alive during World War II, which ended in 1945. Similarly, the few people who become believers after the rapture would seem silly to young people who did not live through the aftermath of it. It's easy to imagine a world that would scoff at the possibility of the disappearance of so many people being the actual rapture when, decades later, there is no Antichrist, no tribulation, and no return of Jesus. They would develop a false sense of security and possibly become even more emboldened to carry on the most wicked acts imaginable. Now when they are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction comes on them, like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will surely not escape. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 NET. This would be a world convinced that God does not exist, and in the minds of the people, they have had decades of inactivity from above to prove it. They also wouldn't have the benefit of the Holy Spirit dwelling in believers throughout the world as people do now. Whether they recognize it or not, unbelievers benefit from having spirit-filled believers in the world. Not only do Christians themselves provide many benefits, but the Holy Spirit restrains evil as well. Without the Holy Spirit active in the world, we would presumably be living in times more like those during the Old Testament, which I imagine would take a toll. As one small example, it's believed that witchcraft doesn't work as dramatically today as it did in ancient times because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
In fact, there is a documentable trail of witchcraft's loss of efficacy in the first two or three hundred years of Christianity. We see an example of this in scripture. Now, as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit that enabled her to foretell the future by supernatural means. She brought her owners a great profit by fortune telling. She followed behind Paul and us and kept crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued to do this for many days. But Paul became greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her at once. But when her owners saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. Acts 16, 16 through 19, NET. As it turns out, this kind of activity became quite common. Pay special attention to the fact that in that passage of scripture, the demon-possessed woman was not telling a lie. She was actually telling the truth. Yet this was a demon saying this. How can this be? We get some clues from the writings of Eusebius. About that time, it is said that Apollo spoke from a deep and gloomy cavern and through the medium of no human voice and declared that the righteous men on earth were a bar to his speaking the truth. He suffered his tresses to droop in tokens of grief and mourned the evils which the loss of the oracular spirit would entail on mankind. In this account, the false god Apollo admitted that the presence of Christians was inhibiting his ability to speak. Now, because the presence of the Holy Spirit within Christians was dampening or restraining the works of oracles and the old gods during this time, Christians themselves became more persecuted. As Lactantius wrote, some, through personal ill will towards the Christians, were of opinion that they ought to be cut off as enemies of the gods and adversaries of the established religious ceremonies. Even more interesting, the presence of the Holy Spirit within Christians was causing the false gods to have to be honest about who they were, what they were doing, and who the true God is. We see a bit of that in the book of Acts with Paul's run-in with the fortune teller. What the evil spirit within this woman was saying was correct about Paul and his companions. They were servants of the Most High, and they were proclaiming the way of salvation. Yet, Paul still cast the evil spirit out of this woman. That isn't the only incident like this to be recorded in ancient history. We even have record from Lactantius of one of the final messages of Apollo, who came through an oracle between the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Self-produced, untaught, without a mother, unshaken, a name not even to be comprised in word, dwelling in fire. This is God, and we, his messengers, are a slight portion of God. Here, this Apollo being makes mention of the true God, then admits he's a mere messenger or angel of his. It's as if Apollo cannot help himself, but to start letting some of the truth slip out. In fact, later, when asked about how he would like to be addressed, Apollo says, quote, O all wise, all learned, versed in many pursuits, hear, O demon. Now, this is almost humorous to think about. For generations, Apollo masqueraded as a god. Then the Holy Spirit inhabited Christians and suddenly Apollo was unable to keep up the disguise. He could no longer call himself God, but he was forced to admit who God is. Then he tried saying that he was one of God's angels, but even that was too deceptive to keep up anymore. So he eventually slipped up and when asked how he wanted to be addressed, or supplicated in the words of Lactantius, Apollo requested to be called a demon. Even more, Apollo apparently didn't just slip up once, but he kept doing it over and over again. Lactantius continues, And so again, when the entreaty of someone he uttered an imprecation against, the Smithian Apollo, he began with this verse, O harmony of the world, bearing light, all wise demon. What therefore remains except that by his own confession he is subject to the scourge of the true God and to everlasting punishment? For in another response he also said, The demons who go about the earth and about the sea without weariness are subdued beneath the scourge of God. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit did more to damage the kingdom of darkness than we typically realize. If their power is restrained and it is difficult for them to maintain lies to humanity anymore, it would explain a lot of what's going on in our world. If the presence of the Holy Spirit dampens the kingdom of darkness, then of course they would try to degrade society as much as possible. 
possible. They would try to dampen the Holy Spirit by deceiving people into rejecting Jesus. This could explain the fascination in our society with witchcraft, severe moral decay, and a denial of the Holy Spirit as a co-equal member of the Trinity, as seen in almost every cult who calls themselves Christian. It is simply the kingdom of darkness trying to get their power back. The less presence and influence the Holy Spirit has in a location, meaning the fewer number of Christians, then the more powerful the kingdom of darkness becomes in that area. This is why they had such a difficult time when Christianity was exploding through the world in the first few centuries and the enemy just resorted to killing them. However, that did not work and Christianity was strong in the world for a long time. Today, however, these evil entities are making a bit of a restrained comeback. Now, if all of this is true, when the Holy Spirit is removed, there should be a resurgence of all manners of sorcery and witchcraft that will suddenly begin operating in dramatic ways. This is likely the explanation behind the lying signs and wonders of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and other individuals during that time that we read about in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. Now imagine decades of that. It would become the new normal. Not only does this explain all the magic, sorcery, and witchcraft in the Old Testament, but having this understanding can help bring certain Bible passages about the future into clearer focus. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12, KJV. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 13 through 14, KJV. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Matthew 24, 23 through 24, KJV. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their witchcraft, nor of their sexual immorality, nor of their thefts. Revelation 9, 20 through 21, NASB. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Revelation 13, 11 through 15 KJV. Now it becomes easier to imagine why the generation of the tribulation will be so reluctant to repent. The restraining power of sorcery and witchcraft will have been released and all manner of previously impossible things will suddenly become possible. This will become such an ingrained part of society and life in general. It'll become nearly impossible for people to refuse. Perhaps this has something to do with the strong delusion mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12. If the end of this age is truly 2075, as the Essenes claimed, and if that is the year Jesus will return, then we would expect the tribulation to begin in 2068. However, if the rapture were to occur much earlier, let's say at the beginning of the final 50-year jubilee of our age in 2025, then the world would have had 43 years to forget and move on from the great disappearance. And amazingly, this is the exact number of years between the death of Jesus and the end of the age of Torah in 75 AD.
The rapture could occur in 2025, leaving 43 years until the beginning of the tribulation, or the rapture could happen in 2032 AD, leaving 43 years until the return of Jesus, the end of the tribulation. Either way, we would have had 43 years with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ if the rapture came in 2025 instead of a few years or decades later. In fact, if the rapture came a bit later, say in 2038 rather than 2025, we could consider the principle of jubilees as a period of rest. Every 50th year is a jubilee, and there are 40 jubilee cycles in a span of 2,000 years, which according to the Essenes is the length of an age. Our church age, our age of grace, has already almost been 2,000 years. Could it be possible that these jubilee years are being saved up for us and we will experience 40 years with our Lord after the rapture but before the tribulation after 2,000 years of the church being on the earth? Or possibly God will give us a full jubilee cycle with him in heaven. The rapture could happen in 2025, giving us 50 years, a full jubilee, to reside in heaven with him until we return with Jesus in 2075. Now, of course, this is all speculation and we cannot pin down an exact date for the rapture, tribulation, or return of Christ, but it is certainly interesting to think about. What I have just shared with you is only a glimpse into what I reveal in my new book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran. Who could have known how much influence the writings of a mysterious group of prophets and scribes hundreds of years before Christ would have on our understanding of end times prophecy? As it turns out, much of what we've been taught about first century Israel is incomplete. There were, in fact, Jewish believers who knew exactly what to expect in the coming Messiah, that he would be God in the flesh and would die for our sins. If they accurately predicted the first arrival of Jesus, what did they say about his soon return? In this groundbreaking book, you will learn how an ancient Jewish calendar actually predicts the year 2025 AD as prophetically significant, how the enigmatic group known as the Essenes formed and what influence they had over the New Testament. Lost prophecies only recently discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls about our time today. What messages the Essenes left behind for believers living in this present age? How the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation fit within the ancient Essene timetable. What hidden feasts and festivals the Essenes observed and what they point to in the future. The circumstances of the Essenes' disappearance and how it connects to every Christian from the past 2,000 years to the present day. Once you learn about the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls they left behind, you will understand the entirety of the Bible in a brand new light. Finally, the prophetic texts of scripture can be understood as originally intended. So click the link below to order your digital copy of The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, or go to sidroth.org slash peck to discover what God is revealing in these final years of our current age and what is ahead in the next age soon to come.